Known throughout the world, Simon Winchester is the author of many best-selling non-fiction works, including The Professor and the Madman. USA Today has called him a master at telling a complex story compellingly and lucidly. His new book is The Man Who Loved China. National Book Critics Circle nominee Alexander Heyman has written two widely acclaimed books and has been called not simply gifted, but necessary by the New York Times. His latest novel is The Lazarus Project. Rabia Alamedine is the widely praised author of three previous works of fiction. His new book, The Hakawadi, which means the storyteller in Arabic, has been called a gorgeous, glorious masterpiece by Amy Tan. Nam Lee was born in Vietnam and has lived in Australia and the United States. Juno Diaz has described his first book, a collection of stories called The Boat, as an extraordinary performance. The title page for this episode reads, Found in Translation. Simon Winchester, the um, subject of your book, uh, The Man Who Loved China, is uh, about a man who loved China. But it's kind of a love story in another way, too. He's Joseph Needham, an extraordinary, eccentric English biochemist. He fell in love with a Chinese woman and had an affair with her that uh, his wife of the time was entirely content with. And indeed, after 51 years, the subject of his love affair, a woman called Lu Guizhen, finally married him, having been waiting in the wings for half a century. But above all, it is the story of this man's tryst, which began when he was 37 years old, with a country of which he up to that point knew nothing at all. Suddenly, through the language which she, Gui Zhen, taught him, he became totally enraptured by the country. And so the story really is of a man discovering a completely alien universe and devoting his entire life to it when he was put on this earth, or so he thought, to devote his life to biochemistry in Cambridge. And the culmination of this love affair was a book, which is because this is really a book about a book, um, which remains the longest, largest, most authoritative book in the English language on China, which at the time of speaking now is 24 volumes long. I mean, it's a massive encyclopedia type tome. It's been different numbers of volumes at different times, as I recall. Well, sort of Like yes. an accordion. <laughs> Indeed, like an accordion, which Joseph Needham played. He was, oddly <laughs> enough, he was, well, he was a nudist. And so people said, well, thank God at least he didn't play the cymbals, which <laughs> would, would not be an appropriate <laughs> instrument. <laughs> But yes, like an accordion, or like Topsy at Grode. I mean, his, his, when he conceived the idea of writing the book in 1948, his proposal to Cambridge University Press was for, I can do China in one volume. Uh -huh. And then maybe three, and then, well, seven. But maybe volume four of that has to be divided into three parts. Well, no, maybe 13 parts. Anyway, by the time he died, the book, which was in 1995, the book was 17 volumes. And it's still being produced and based on his notes, and it's now 24, and I think it's going to go to 28. You, you said his wife was content with this uh, adulterous affair with a young Chinese. I think she was a biochemist also. She was, as was Dorothy, the wife. Everyone was, uh, obviously, there's something about biochemists. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's called chemistry, I think. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, biochemistry, yes. Uh, there was chemistry there. Yes, um, was. Why was she okay with it? Well, I think it was the, the, the mood of the times. I mean, both of them, both Joseph and Dorothy, were extremely left-wing. I mean, one might almost say he never joined the Communist Party, but he was a Marxist, uh, as was Dorothy. And this was Cambridge in the 1930s. This was the time of the apostles, of the spies, Kim Philby and people like that. And there was an atmosphere of sort of left-wing tolerance and general complacency. And he said to her uh, on the day they got married in 1925, I think it was, I hope you're going to be content with this, but I'm going to pursue other interests. And she said, yeah, dear Joseph, whatever. She didn't say anything so vulgar as whatever floats your <laughs> boat, but <laughs> it was that was essentially air, yeah. what, what it was all about. So when Gui Zhen came into their lives, um, she affected to be content. I suspect she probably was quite hurt, but her diaries don't reveal it. And um, 
So because of his love affair with this young Chinese biochemist, Joseph Needham sets off to China. Can you roughly tell us what kinds of things happened to him there and what he found? And, and well, I think, first of all, why did he go? And it's a very interesting situation that obtained in the China of the mid-1930s. The Japanese had invaded, so Japan occupied the eastern third of China. And all the intellectual establishments, the universities in Beijing and Shanghai, were in now Japanese-held territory. And what the Chinese universities did is that they moved lock, stock, and barrel their universities westward into the comparative safety of free China. Uh, the obvious parallel is if you can imagine the eastern United States being occupied by a hostile foreign power, and Harvard and Yale and Princeton put all their professors and students and books and laboratory equipment on the backs of donkeys and horses, and they marched to Denver or Salt Lake City. That was what was going on in China in the 1930s. And the British government thought, this is monstrous. We must, we're doing very little to help the Chinese. I mean, the, that's another subtext to all of this. The British and the Americans were neutral. They didn't condemn the Japanese for invading, not in the early days anyway. But let's help the Chinese intellectual institutions. And so they decided to, particularly in the field of science, make sure that these evacuated universities now in places like Changsha and Chongqing and Kunming in Western China were supplied with everything they needed from Calcutta. They'd be flown over the hump. And the man who was to organize that, the man who was to go and look at all these academic institutions and see what they needed was this scientist who now spoke Chinese, Joseph Needham. And he went there and for three, three and a half years he traveled in the most trying circumstances to the very outer reaches of China and he had all sorts of adventures and accidents and uh, it, it was very very difficult but he came back with having helped them and um, supplied all the, everything that they needed but also he amassed an enormous amount of information about early Chinese science. 24 volumes worth. 24 Just volumes but making the point that we arrogantly in the West think that nearly all scientific discoveries come from the West, have originated in the West. And this, of course, is absolutely untrue. Tell me, if you will, three or four of the things that he found that we in the West hadn't known about with regard to Chinese discovery and knowledge and so on. Well, I suppose the classic is this. I mean, Francis Bacon made this remark in the 18th century that the three greatest inventions in the dominated world history were uh, printing, gunpowder, and the compass. When he wrote that, he had no idea where those things originated. I suppose the assumption was that the compass was Venetian and uh, printing was either Gutenberg or Caxton and gunpowder, well, who knows. Needham established beyond all doubt that the first compass was Chinese, that the first printing was the Diamond Sutra, which is a Buddhist document printed in 868, so 600 years before the West started printing. And gunpowder used for hostile purposes, not just for fireworks, which was the somewhat arrogant assumption in the West that, well, the Chinese might have made it, but they only used it for decorative events, that they were using it in the, in the sixth century for hostile purposes. I thought I would just read the A's of, in the back, wonderful Starting with abacus, of, of course. Abacus, acupuncture, advisory vessels, whatever they whatever are. Whatever they are. Air conditioning fan, alcohol made from grain by special fermentation process, that's mm -hmm. a very good. Yeah, we'll Algorithm, anatomy, anchor, anemometer, et cetera, et cetera. And the whole list is just astonishing. This man uncovered truths. Uh, secret, sort of secret uh, truths that the West hadn't known about. Alexander Heyman, in some ways, your book is also about trying to find out a hidden truth from the past. Can you say what that is? The central event of the book is the killing of a young Jewish immigrant in Chicago in 1908, uh, Lazarus Averbuch, who for some reason um, went to the door of the chief of police at the time, George Shippey, and then was promptly shot by the chief of police who later on said that, you know, as soon as he saw him, he knew he was an anarchist because he looked, I think originally he said he was, uh, he looked Sicilian or Armenian, which is to say dark skin. But the story is told from a modern point of view. Val yeah. Vladimir Brick is yeah, the he's a, he's narrator. A, he's a contemporary writer of a background similar to mine who tries to figure out what happened 
or tries to get close to Lazarus. Why does he care? I guess he identifies with uh, Lazarus' um, immigration situation. He had survived, Lazarus had survived the, the pogrom in Kishinev in 1903, which was most brutal and uh, most famous, one of the early pogroms. And then came to Chicago, um, and only seven or eight months later, he was shot by the chief of police. His American dream did not work out at all. But there was something in Brick and in me, I suppose, that um, led him to Lazarus and uh, um, want, made him want to find out what happened. Why was that life so short and so unhappy? Um, Is he not struggling with his own identity, Vladimir Brick, about whether he, where he belongs and what sort of he, he, he has an ambiguous relation with, with America. On the one hand, his wife is uh, American. He has some modest success in what he does. Uh, but he's also very Bosnian. Uh, he says that he's a loyal citizen of at least two countries at one point in the book. In, in an interview I've read with you, there's a sense that in this book and in the interview that Americans are somewhat innocently or naively blank about the rest of the world, even today. Well, yes. They, they have a, an argument, Brick and, and Mary, about the Abu Ghraib pictures and, um, and everything around that. Yes, I, um, where Mary thinks that the Abu Ghraib, and by extension the, the Iraq fiasco and many other fiascos that we're living through right now, they're all really um, a consequence of good intentions going bad. So when she looks at the Abu Ghraib picture, she sees, you know, just young American kids who got Messed scared up. away. Yeah. Um, and so in that, to that extent, Mary is a decent person because she believes in the inherent goodness of people, and particularly in the inherent goodness of Americans. We just can't do no wrong uh, because we never really want to do any wrong. Whereas Brick sees it entirely differently. He sees this, you know, uh, augmentation of power fantasies in those pictures, the living out of fantasies. not and which is entirely connected with this fantasy of inherent goodness and inherently Innoc good intentions. Innocence. Because we can, if we can ever do wrong, we can do whatever we want, right. whenever we as want. As long to. as we say it's Right, as it's long as it's with good intentions. So, you know, we go to Iraq with good intentions and, well, you know, it goes a little bad, few bad apples, we take them out. It's all nice again. Do you think that 9-11 um, casts a shadow on this novel, The Lazarus Project? It did, yeah, but not 9-11, it is the post-9-11 um, atmosphere, the sort of the, the forcible unification of Americans, the, uh, the suppression of um, dissonant voices, as it were. Suddenly we were all united in the war on terror, and those who were not united were, you know, cast out. One of the things that this book is about, I think, is also the complicity of a lot of people, even if inadvertent, even if based uh, on good intentions in the whole, you know, the fiasco, post 9-11 fiasco. Um, and Brick's frustration with that. And I have to say that part of his frustration is very similar to mine, because in some ways I felt more at home before this unification, more at home in the United States, sort of set me apart. Because not for a moment, for instance, did I believe that there were weapons of the mass destruction in Iraq. Yeah. It never crossed my mind. It was, it was fantastic to me to watch a large number of people you know, going for something that is most obviously a blatant lie. And it just pushed me away from what I right. um, found to be, for, for what I recognized, from what I recognized as, as the uh, home here in so many ways. Um, the book's about storytelling, it seems to me, and in a very serious way about storytelling. I want to read a passage and then ask you to sort of comment on it a little bit. It says, Sari Yavins told stories ever aware that the listener's attention might flag. So they exaggerated and embellished and sometimes downright lied to keep it up. There was a storytelling code of solidarity. You did not sabotage someone else's narration if it was satisfying to the audience. Or you could expect one of your stories to be sabotaged one day, too. Disbelief was permanently suspended, for nobody expected truth or information, just the pleasure of being in the story. Part of the book has to do with Vladimir's imagining of that assassination and who was thinking what. 
I read this whole book in a very deep way, not only as being about immigrant identity, but as about storytelling and fiction and lying and truth-telling. Did you intend to stimulate the reader that way? Yes, um, very much so. I remember recently reading about a study. They have all kinds of studies that, you know, after years of studying, they just um, show what is most obvious to anyone who has read a book before. So this study said that um, people apparently imagine their lives as stories and then live accordingly. So if they imagine themselves to be brave or courageous or ambitious, they try to live up to the standard. If you've read Madame Bovary, you know, she lives out uh, her story fantasy. So to the stories constitute, you know, your identity or the story of your life is, uh, constitutes your identity. You become a character in the story of your life. And so this to me seems most obvious and most basic in everyone's life. But then the stories multiply. And if you have conflicting stories, and for in an immigrant situation, you have the story of your past life that you're telling to the people in the new land, as they were, and which means you have to, you enter a discourse of various kinds of prejudices, some good, some bad, but, you know, fantasies of people about you. I was once told by a very nice woman in Chicago, she said, it must be neat to be from other cultures, as though other cultures were an archipelago in the Pacific, where we were, <laughs> you know, swam and with the dolphins and... You know, uh, eat I coconut. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so there's this fantasy of otherness that you enter and you cannot um, get out of it. So in order to be acquire an identity, as it were, in the United States, you have to tell stories about yourself to the new people. But in the modern immigrant situation, what ends up happening is that you have to tell stories about yourself in the new land to the people from the old land. And it, it is in this stretch that suddenly your identities, as they were, multiply. Mm. In other words, you become two different people. Rora is a master storyteller. I just have to ask one more question about Rora because in some ways he bursts off the page. Not that your other characters aren't vivid, especially Lazarus's sister, who is a very strong character too. But Rora is a storyteller, basically. And that's where I felt that you were saying to the reader a little bit, think about the storytelling in this book. Yes, and he's also not only a storyteller, but the stories are not about himself, as it were. He's just a character in the stories that he's telling. So there's no, um, you know, the, the, the storytelling mode in the United States or uh, narrative mode is often confessional, whether it's a memoir or just, you know, novels as, as concealed uh, confessions. So it is easy to read other people's books um, as, as being about themselves. But Rora tells stories and he might be present in those stories, but those stories do not tell the reader or the listener much about what he might have felt at the moment and you know, what kind of no, self-improvement he, he might sort be working of a, on. a dark Dickensian storyteller. He tells about other yeah. people. He's characters. kind of an epic storyteller, much like um, in Robbie's book. There is someone who is complete at the beginning of storytelling. There's no right. development. He's a very vivid character. He's a friend of Brick's who accompanies Brick on the... On the, mission, on the journey to, to Bosnia, to, to Eastern Europe, right. to yes. find stuff out. He's also a photographer. Right, and the photographs are very important, and maybe we can talk about them in a minute, but you've given me my transition, so to speak, to Rabi, who's also, whose book is also magnificently about storytelling. Um, it is a compendium of, of Middle Eastern um, legends and myths mixed with a modern day uh, Lebanese story. Can you talk about the way you put it together and, and why you did it that way? It's difficult to say why I did it that way because it's so obvious to me uh, when I was doing it that it's supposed to be that way. Uh, I mean, he, he talked about storytelling, stole my words. Uh, the whole idea of how we define ourselves is, I think, uh, that we define ourselves through the stories we believe about ourselves, and not just us, uh, cultures do as well. Uh, I mean, as an example, he was talking about uh, the, in the good intentions. Uh, there is a cultural story here that Americans, as we as Americans, are good people and have good intentions, which is a great story and lovely, and that's how we behave and how that's how we see ourselves. So every culture sort of defines itself by the stories they tell. 
So then in, in the it, Middle East, what is, what's the definition? Well, uh, the definition uh, is, is partly grandiose, uh, partly uh, we are victimized constantly. The, all the Crusades and the Mongols and uh, that, uh, uh, it's, that we're not in control of our destiny. Fate. Fate. Mm -hmm. Fate is a big, big deal. But so that the culture and the countries uh, and the whole land begins to be defined by these big stories. And then the families also tell similar stories that are both derived from the, the cultural stories and slight vari variants or variations on the theme. Help me with the pronunciation of the present day narrator's name. It's Osama Al Kharat. Al Kharat. Kharat. Why is he, he lives in the United States, but he's back in Beirut? He's back in Beirut because uh, he does visit at some points, but he's back in Beirut because his father is dying. Uh, he actually goes back for, to celebrate uh, what we call the Eid al-Adha, uh, and he uh, finds out that his father is in the hospital. So they begin to sit vigil, and there's all the storytelling that goes on. The book is made like a tapestry. It's, right. it's, it's interwoven myths and legends. Um, uh, one of the characters who really, uh, in, in a continuing story, who appealed to me was a Othman. 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 Who seems to be an archetypal figure in right. some ways. What, he, he, he was familiar to me, but even though I'd never heard of him before. Oh, he's familiar to every story. He's, he's the trickster. Um, and it's funny because the, there's a part in the book where they talk about the original story. Uh, he appears in the story of Babers, uh, the sultan, and he was a 12th century uh, sultan. A historical figure, a real, a, historical. A real historical figure. Right. Now, this historical figure, um, the reason there are so many stories about him is that he actually uh, paid people to tell stories about him. Uh, it's sort of, uh, I, George do, Bush. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say like Arab presidents, okay? Uh, yeah, it, it's sort of over here now, say, you know, Bush sends out the media people to talk. He actually paid Hakawatis, which are the storytellers of the time, to tell stories about him. Well, that's why we have so many stories about him. The thing is that for the storytellers, they have to go into, say, the villages and the cafes and tell stories about this king. Well, nobody was interested in a king. They couldn't identify. So all of a sudden, the king develops a sidekick, this little trickster who is a stable boy and uh, becomes by the, you know, early on, the hero of the actual adventure of Babers. So that the story of Babers is never about Babers. It's about the sidekicks. Othman. Othman. And Othman, of course, through time became sort of a uh, archetypal trickster. It's a little bit like, yeah. Yeah, I, I loved him. He was, he, every time he, he turned up, I knew something uh, mischievous yeah. uh, or even evil was going to happen. Yeah, well, tr yeah, it's something tricky. And then, of course, it's like the start and the idea was taken from the real story. But then in my book, uh, it took off. You know, I don't think in any other story of Babers he was married. In mine, he was married and then his wife took over. Did you have in mind a mission of some sort to tell us somewhat pre more provincial, even to this day, Americans, about the richness of, of Middle Eastern culture and to explain that it's more varied and more, um, and has a wider scope than we might imagine? Well, yes. I mean, and, but that was never the main intention. For me, particularly in this book, the main intention is to tell a great story. Okay, that's first and foremost. Everything else sort of fall, uh, as sort of, shall we call them, secondary intentions. Because no matter what story I tell, because of my background, these things will fall into place. So I never meant to write a story that was to introduce the world to, say, uh, Lebanese culture. I sort of introduced some things of Lebanese culture because of who I am and the kind of stories that I like to tell. Mm. So the main intention for me always has to be to tell a great story. Well, you've certainly uh, done that and, and told a lot of them. I want to read a passage um, about a genie. Yes. Um, and I hope I can say his name right, Afrit Jannah. Jahannam. Jahannam. Afrit Jahannam, which and basically means the demon of hell. The demon of hell. Um, 
his putrid stench, this is, this is part of, a, of one of the legends in, in the book, of, of which there are many and interwoven. And this is the genie who's appeared. His putrid stench would have suffocated an infant. The smell of months old eggs, rotting garbage, and decaying flesh. Hundreds of black crows picked at his teeth for bits of food. They flew in and out of his nose, looked like flies because of his size. The hides of seven rhinos made up his loincloths. He wore a necklace of human skulls that hung to his navel, with two loops around his neck like a pearl collar. Through the space between his legs, she could see Jawad and Kyle fleeing. Those are the characters that are involved. That's not I Dream of Genie. No, it's not I Dream of Genie. <laughs> <laughs> Jinn come in all shapes and sizes. They're supposed to be demons. That one was actually based uh, partly on uh, some jinns, but it was also based on Kali, you know, the, the Indian uh, oh. goddess. Um, so it's, I think the word is syncretistic. Yeah, syncretistic or something. <laughs> something like that. Uh, it's, I mean, that's, it's like how, what I want to say in some ways is that this is not exactly uh, like Arabic culture. It's, it's mostly a product of my imagination. And since Arabic culture has influenced me, it, right. it comes out that way. And you take the same liberties in some ways. I take all kinds of liberties. With the stories that, that, um, that a storyteller, that a Hakawadi, Absolutely. you are Absolutely. a Hakawadi. Absolutely. And, and you are actually earning, to some extent, earning your bread by telling stories. Absolutely. As they did. Yeah. Be modern day Beirut and this very colorful Persian rug tapestry that you, if I may say Persian rug, I'm not sure of oh, no, the no, niceties. Persian, yes. This, the modern story of Osama is sort of sad uh, as he watches his father decline. Mm -hmm. And Beirut itself is sort of war-torn. Did you mean there to the reader to feel a sadness? Uh, some, a sadness of what was lost. But I didn't see the situation as that sad. I mean, though the father is dying, his stories are alive. So that the family stories that they tell, it, it's like... Uh, I, I was joking with a writer the other day that I usually, since it's a long-term story, as in it starts with the grandfather and even earlier than the grandfathers of how they met, how he was born, all these people start with, you know they're dead because it's a contemporary story, mm -hmm. but they're alive because you keep hearing the stories about them. And basically the whole idea of sitting on a deathbed and telling the stories of the family and these mythical stories is about that no matter what's going to happen, the stories themselves will live on. And whether we as people live on through the stories we're told, or that we make these stories alive, is, is, a fascinating, is something that I'm fascinated with. So that, yes, it might be sad because of what's happening to Beirut, but the Beirut stories are told through hundreds of years. You get to see Beirut in a different context, and hopefully, somehow, Beirut where it be, could become. This modern era of violence may become part of They'll the story. They'll become, yeah. They'll centuries become, from now. and it might be great stories. We S hope. Speaking of speaking of stories, Nam Lee's book. Uh, I think you have five or six stories in it. Seven stories. Seven stories. Sorry, and they are from everywhere. Um, they're from Vietnam. They're from Australia. They're from Iowa Writers Workshop. But the the book is bookended by two. Vietnamese stories. One about a writer in Iowa who is considering writing about a story about his father and the relationship between them. And the last book about the famous boat people, or sadly famous boat people of Vietnam escaping after um, the communists take over Vietnam. Ordinarily, I don't, ask, I don't like to ask fiction writers about <laughs> autobiography, but in this case, I'm going to violate my own principle and not ask you how true they are, but ask you how important they were to you personally and why they're at either end of the book. It's a good question, um, and it's one that I've been thinking about for a long time. And I guess when I was writing the first story in the collection, one of the ideas that I was trying to play with was the idea of, you know, authenticity, the idea of, you know, what is it that we bring um, as readers to a story um, that may differ depending on whether we think that it's autobiographical or not. 
Um, so part of that was very playful, part of that was very self-conscious, and I, I very much wanted to exploit the very, um, well, the very ironies, I guess, that the story itself was trying to exploit, but at the same time to have my cake and eat it too. And, you know, part of that question was, you know, for me, the idea that I didn't want to be, and I don't want to be, pigeonholed, um, in a sense, into any type of, um, you know, ethnic category. And I'm extravagantly proud of, you know, who I am and my family history. Um, but when I think about what it is that, you know, defines what I'm doing, it makes much more sense for me, in a way, to think of myself as a writer writing in English than, you know, a Vietnamese Australian writer or a Vietnamese writer. And or so, a Colombian writer. Or a Colombian writer or, or a lesbian yeah. vampire, well, you know, <laughs> et cetera. The, 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 but now this really surprises me, I have to say, because to think of these two stories as being somewhat playful is remarkable because they're very serious. In one case, a son is thinking about his relationship to his Vietnamese father who was abusive. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, it's a modern word, but I can't think of another one. And in the other, it takes place on a boat, and it's a poignant story about people who are starving to death and sure. what kind of connection is made. I find it hard to think of them as being meta-fictional, I mean, as, as being sort of ironical at all. Yeah. They were very powerful. I, I really dislike the, uh, the meta-term, I guess. <laughs> and um, in these stories, I guess what I'm, the, the constant struggle that I was dealing with was the idea of having to find, um, you know, both a form and a mode of articulation um, that would get these stories across, that mm -hmm. would give these voices some sort of dignity and access, and that would, you know, create a space in which readers could come in and, you know, partake in that empathetic exercise. You know, these are, um, these are atrocious things that happen. These are atrocities. Yes, know? they are. And, and in, in, in many ways, um, the idea that these things can even be transposed into language is very problematic. And so I think, you know... Then I have to say that, that those theoretical sort of, or aesthetical considerations are not, I mean, they, we're talking about them and it's very interesting, but the, but the stories themselves live the way, I think, and, and affect us the way they ought to. They're very powerful. How, the, another story takes place in, in Colombia uh, where there's a young, I believe he's 15 or 16? 14. Yeah. 14. Uh, he's a paid assassin. Um, uh, he is in a drug gang and he is paid to knock off other people. How, again, a slightly autobiographical question. How do you know about <laughs> that? Is it research? Um, it's a bunch of things, I guess. It's, uh, it's what I was thinking about and watching and reading and, you know, being interested in at the time. Uh, I did visit Colombia when, um, back in 2003, 2002, I think, and, you know, there were, there were moments and there were images and there were relationships and dynamics that stayed with me. Um, most of the stuff from that trip hasn't availed itself in language at all, but when it came to that point, it just so happened that yeah. that was something which was, you know, taking up real estate in my head. And so, again, it was just a situation that was in search of a voice. And, and yes, it was just a bunch of research. At the, at the, uh, I thought there was some research, but it's still very immediate and very alive. It's a testimony to the power of your writing. And another sort of general question is whether you meant the stories to have moral commentary on such things as the atomic bomb or as the Vietnam War or, I mean, the Australian one isn't so clear. There's one that takes place in Tehran. There's a political element. Were you hoping that some of that would come through? I mean, yes. Um, not in a programmatic or a didactic way, hopefully, but in a way that, you know, makes, makes it clear that I'm advertent to and hopefully my readers' um, consciousnesses. The matter of finding secrets or dis making discoveries from other lands and nations and bringing them to us in America, is it sort of a, 
Is it, do we need this? Is it sort of a mission, as I was asking before? I, I really have no educational interest, really. You know, it's the Americans' problems if they don't know about other lands. I really, it's not, I've never thought for a moment that somehow I'm the one who's supposed to represent Bosnian culture to Americans, or to anyone, doesn't matter. I mean, Bosnian culture, is, it's complicated in so many ways that I, I, um, I can't do it. But also, I really, really dislike the notion of, of a writer representing a culture. Yeah. You know, it's not an elected yeah. office. I write from a personal point of view, uh, not as an autobiographical um, project, but I have questions about the world. I put them in language. Those questions are not uncommon. And I like what um, Naam said about the space that you open up for the reader. You know, I bring up things, and then people walk in into the, the space. I build up, you know, the, the, the backdrop for, for a story, and then we walk in and we talk about those things. Not the notion that I would be lecturing someone about what Bosnia is about is... Or the, the notion that he is able to right. tell somebody about it's Bosnia. I mean, for me, one of the things that fascinates me is when somebody will go, oh, I learned so much about Lebanon, uh, and I want to go, you know, it's like in, in one street in Lebanon, there are all kinds of different people and all kinds of different cultures. Uh, and so let alone that in the city itself or in Lebanon or the Arab world, so that for one writer to be able to say, or that I can tell you about the culture, I cannot tell you about American culture or I cannot tell you about Lebanese culture. I can tell you a story and hopefully it will introduce something new, but it has little to do with uh, being Lebanese or being American or, or being a representative. Uh, being representative. But I, I, hang on a bit. I, I, I think your books inevitably will oh, yeah. turn out to be the book that one nowadays reads to learn about Lebanese culture or Bosnian culture. I remember the first time I went to to the Balkans. I was in Cyprus and uh, flying off uh, somewhere, and I asked. Uh, in fact, flying to to Beirut during the civil war and. I, James Morris, no, Jan Morris, said, go to a particular bookseller in, in Nicosia who will advise you on what book to read. And I went to this wizened old man and I said, all right, I'm a complete ingenue. I'm going for the first time in my life to Beirut at the height of the, the troubles. What should I read? And he said, the Bible, which I thought was a wonderful <laughs> answer. But single books do often, and I'm th th similarly, when I first went to the Balkans, I read a, a book, a novel, I'm sure you'll know well, The Bridge on the Drina, which for me, perhaps the author never set out in a didactic way to tell, as a mission to tell people about the situation in the Balkans, but my reading it, it worked for me, and I suspect that's what's going to happen with your books, whether you intend it to be so or not. I agree, but the question is more specific here because the, the author, Ivo Andrich, he wrote this book not for Americans to learn about Bosnia. He wrote it because it allowed him to, um, you can learn about places in the world and countries from the books, but to assume that as a mission is problematic. Mm -hmm. I yes. never think and that, you know, the, my book does not tell you anything about Bosnia, anything relevant, or America for that matter, or any place. I've written about Shanghai. But to start with this position that s somehow I am now, it's my mission to tell Americans or whoever about Bosnia, that Bosnia somehow elected me to tell America. But who is suggesting that you are have that mission? Um, that was my question. It was you're, my you're question. The, the I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bad guy here. <laughs> I do think Americans in particular approach works of, of fiction and nonfiction that are meant to tell their own stories in a kind of educate me sort of way. It's like part of the trouble right now that I think we're having is that we look, say, at the Arab world and see it as one homogeneous culture. Uh, and I mean, you see it in the newspapers all the time. I mean, they, there's like these headlines is, the Arab street objects to such and such. What Arab street? <laughs> uh, right now, say, there's all the things against, uh, against China and Tibet. I mean, China is one billion people. The government one, may one, be occu occupying Tibet. Most people in China wouldn't even give a damn about Tibet, yet we always say the Chinese. And against the Tibetans. Exactly. Or, and then, you know, so the Arabs, how can I, how can you learn anything? In, I mean, you might be able to learn something, but really, how can this book sort of give you, an, give you anything more than just a glimpse of how 300 million people live? So the idea then of, of these books, of, of Simon's book, 
of, is, is more about the, the fiction and nonfiction, more about individuality, of picking out stories that interest you, telling them, and hoping the reader. For instance, the, the, the Joseph Needham. I mean, one of my theories about him in reading the book was if he hadn't met that beautiful young Chinese woman, he might well have become a genius in another field. That it was his character, in a way, that mattered more. Yes, than he it may not have been as interesting a genius. I mean, in other words, he might not have deployed his mental powers to such good effect in, in finding out so much about China. It might have been he might have won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry right. and jolly good, but he, you know, it might have been somewhat obscure, and, and, and he is fairly obscure, although not in China. He's every Chinese person knows Li Yusur, which is his Chinese name. I want to come back to a point you made, though, about, if I may, about the, the Arab world, the, homo, the alleged supposed homogeneity, everyone, the Arabs or the Chinese. That's what people say about the Americans, and you two have been oh, saying it, the Americans. Uh, I mean, no, who I, are, yeah, no, yeah. no, I don't need to charge you, but who are Americans? Uh, that's exactly what I was going to say, because he was saying, oh, we Americans tend to be, no, I'm American too, and I'm not, and, and so is he. You know, we're not that, as a culture, we're not that. But he <laughs> has written a book about, with a kind of <coughs> typology of Americanism, I mean, or certain kinds of, for instance, the police chief and the uh, newspaper reporter who write about the old murder. They represent a kind of, I mean, to me, they can't help but represent a certain, at least, aspect of this country. Well, absolutely, a certain aspect, but also they are sort of transnational type, you know, um, an ambitious policeman. I mean, that's not unique to Americans. That's what the East European countries are now, is corrupted power. Mm -hmm. Corrupted power is transnational. <laughs> we read fiction and nonfiction to find out essentially about other people and to find out about ourselves, to find out what they think, what we think, how we feel. So, so and how we feel about ourselves and the world. The difference is between consumption of information and knowledge. And knowledge requires engagement. You know, you read books, but I don't read the book, uh, uh, Robbie's book, to learn about Lebanon. I read this book to enjoy it, and then I absorb the knowledge of Lebanon. Right. And this takes me to the right. next book on Lebanon right. or whatever else. It's, it's not just about Lebanon. And so what books do is that they keep you engaged with the, with the human knowledge, the, the, the knowledge of human experience. It's specific, it's specific. and <coughs> dramatic, so, and then there's also the after effect of, right. of increased but understanding. But treat the novel like a travel guide, which you can then use you can to do consume. That. The, well, you could, but I mean, you know, I wouldn't do it with my book. <laughs> no, I don't, to to be also, I don't want to be shot. I don't want to be shot at a cafe. But, but it's, also, <laughs> it's, it's also the whole idea of, is, is as a writer, uh, I mean, yes, you're supposed to entertain, but is the other, on the other hand, instruct? I mean, this is what I'm, I think if you look at all, it's like the four books here, it's not about instruction. I think part of the trouble is, is what is the writer's intention? Mm. I think if, you, if a writer sits down and say, I'm going to teach about something, I'm going to show, uh, show you the Arab world, or I'm going to show you about Bosnia, or then uh, you'll run into a lot of trouble. Now, if you start with, I'm going to uh, you know, look at this problem, you know, and maybe the reader will be able to look at this problem with me, then that's a different kind of thing. But I think what, one of the things that I always say is, it's not a polemical thing. I, it, as a writer, most writers do it instinctively, which is you sort of force, w without even intending to do it, you have the reader look at something in a different way. I call it rattling cages. So whether you're talking about the genius who's writing about China, uh, it, it's not just about entertaining, but it's also about telling the reader that there is a different way of looking at the world. Absolutely, yeah. Okay? yeah. And I think that is different than coming in with, let me teach you about this different way of looking let at the world. Let me show you. Let me tell you. Let, let, me, tell you. let, me, tell let you. me tell you. I, I mean, it's like you. coming out of the woods exactly. to a group of people around a campfire, and you say, I've just seen I'm, something amazing, let me tell you. Let me, t let me tell you a story. The enthusiasm of your amazement. I was there. Let me tell you a One story. One of the yeah. things that you tell, that all of you tell us, is about warfare. And there's the Japanese War and, the, and, and then the Korean War with Joseph Needham's fall from grace. Yes. 
There's the Vietnamese War, there's the war in Bosnia, there's modern day Beirut. There's also the Crusades. And the Crusades, and the man who, and the uh, Arab leader who defeated the Crusaders. Uh, I felt a little bit of sort of, you know, as if I were being slightly instructed in that case. But <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Oh, no. No, no, okay. no. The, the narrator was being instructed. The narrator was being instructed. <laughs> but, um, but there is a presence of warfare here and in, in all of the books, and it's a sort of a sad, um, it's a sad aspect of some, actually, some of the stories being happier. Do you, did you, did you all, each of you, think about the presence of conflict in your book? I mean, clearly, you, that was the story you were telling, but did you reflect upon warfare while you were writing? Well, I would, a warfare implies sort of military imperations, but I think of war as a, as a kind of a general moral collapse, or ethical collapse, too. It's demeaning. Um, it's demeaning in the degrees, depends on the war. But to take as an example the, the current fiasco going on, it, it's it, my experience post 9-11, after everything started, just I feel demeaned by the lies, by the propaganda, by the, the un, you know, uh, vulgar patriotism, by the flag waving, by the enforcement of patriotism, all this. That to me is demeaning. It was exactly demeaning in the exactly same way as it was in Bosnia before the war, where, where there was different forces because they had to, you had to be separated into the ethnical groups and then perform these operations. And that to me was demeaning. It dehumanized me, dehumanized all of us, more or less. But I could not join the noble projects so as to noble myself you know, in that project. And this is what my book is dealing with, I think. And for, for we, I mean, we had we have sort of similar stuff because I went through the Lebanese Civil War, and, and it's that we we heard the rhetoric before uh, in terms of a civil war, and it was basically, I mean, it wasn't, it was fascist. So that to hear sort of similar things being said in this country, you know, mm -hmm. that they hate our freedom or they, you <coughs> know, you are with us or against us is the sort of stuff that I grew up with. And right away it was... <sighs> yeah, and it's, it's, it's interesting because I, the current gig that I have is as a, as a writer in residence um, at yeah. a prep school at yeah. Phillips Exeter Academy uh -huh. in New Hampshire. And so one of the, one of the books that is, is constantly on the curriculum there is a separate piece um, by Rick Knowles. And I was told that during one of the classes, the students um, who, who are extraordinarily bright and from, contrary to what you might think, actually drawn from all over the country and all different sort of socio-economic um, uh, brackets, were talking for the entire period without, about, about the, uh, you know, the tribulations of this other set of students during the war, during um, a pa the past war, without once, you know, twigging to the fact that they too were in the middle of a war. Their country was currently engaged in a mm -hmm. war. And that's, that's something which is saddening it and is. disturbing as well. It is. Do you think that with the internet and with the, more, the greater mobility that, uh, of people, that literature is becoming more global now? I mean, do you have a sense that in the last three or four years, again, perhaps especially one of the more advantageous aspects of 9-11 is that we are now beginning to wrestle with the world and that we're learning about, more about China and we're, in, at least in America, we may be somewhat more open? Or am I once again going down the wrong path? I fear you probably are. I mean, it's, it's sad to say, I mean, we're talking to, I, I hope this program is an enormous success, but I mean, if you go to the, and of course you were at Iowa, I'm not going to tar Iowa, I love Iowa deeply, <laughs> but the, much of the flyover country here is people who are not in the slightest bit interested. They just, you know, it's game shows and afternoon TV. And, 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 and it's, it's not just this country. No, 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 it's we're, not just yeah, this country. And see, what's interesting is that we might become global, but we're talking not the globality of literature. But, uh, but here's, here's something interesting. That we, you know, a lot of people, you know, they ask me about writing in English language, and it seems to me um, that very soon, and perhaps even now, is the, that is the case. It, there's nothing, nothing remark, remarkable will be um, said about someone who's writing in English language, and it's not his or her native language. In some ways, people from other parts of the world are moving to the English language yeah. so they can spread uh, mm -hmm. around the world. In a very, I write in Bosnian too, um, a column for a magazine in Sarajevo. 
But I, and so I reach a lot of Bosnians um, around the world, and they're all over the world, like the Lebanese, through the internet, because this column is on the internet. But also because my books have been translated in Denmark and, you know, Europe. Bosnians get to my book yeah. uh, through there, mm -hmm. you know, and, and because they live there. In other words, I, through the English language, in a very weird way, I've been able to reconnect mm -hmm. with Bosnians who have been displaced. And this is the case with so many people, because immigration and displacement, in fact, not immigration, is p possibly, I think, uh, it is indeed the central fact of today's world. And I, I'm sorry. I and English, the English language you know, can host a lot of those things. So if they don't read it now, they might read elsewhere. The trouble is that there's a disparity around the world, globalization, the downside. I don't know if there's an upside, but, you know. Well, the, the upside is, it's I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's here. here. It's here. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's the displacement yeah. in some ways, bringing different people yes. into different areas. As much as it's troubling for the individuals and for the people, it, it, no matter what we, uh, it's like my being an American changes America. No matter right, if I'm yeah. just mm -hmm. one person. Mm -hmm. So you could just imagine if there, I can't imagine two of me. How about, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but well, how about lots of people in here? We change culture. And then Lebanon is changed yeah. by, you know, this absence. So we're constantly moving. Um, I, mean, I really do think that, I mean, I think there is, I think there is a shift. Yeah. Um, but I it's not, in liter it's but not I think global literature. I don't know. Whether I don't know. Like, I mean, Ish Ishiguro once said, um, and it surprised me, and then it surprised me that I was surprised, that he no, long, he no longer wrote for a national audience. He, he oh, thought of his audience as being um, a global audience. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you know, you're talking about movable type, you know, being available in, what, eight, 900 AD? 868. You know, and then 600 years later, the printing press, and then, you know, the various advancements after that. There are always, you know, small esoteric groups of people talking to small esoteric groups of people. You know, barely anyone was literate. Now, I think most of the world is literate. Um, I think much, 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 much more of the world, yeah. for sure. Well, I always remember meeting a Chinese woman on a railway station platform in the north of the Taklamakan Desert. I mean, a really, really remote stretch from Urumqi to Alma'ata. And she stopped me, said, do I speak English? Do I? And I said, yes. And she said, this train is going to remain here for 22 minutes. I would like you to tell me all you know about Anthony Trollope. <laughs> and I thought, I love I this woman. <laughs> you wouldn't find that in the middle of America. Can you tell me all about Ivo Andrich? Can you tell me all about a great Lebanese writer? But you would find it in China, thank heavens. Well, I <laughs> hope that someday that a uh, woman in the middle or a man in the middle of America will ask you all about those writers. I just want to say what a, I feel as if personally, and I think if I speak for title page, that we are so pleased to have you here and that this kind of conversation does represent, I hope, a, a ray of hope in terms of um, um, bringing the idea of literature and separate individual stories that, that, tell, that tell people things that they should know about to a greater public. And thank you for being here. And um, to all of our watchers, I just say, keep reading.